And um, I, yeah, I think so. Or you can, I don't, whatever. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, I just love the, the, the training there. I, how's this? Better? So, yeah, I uh, just wanted to do something for the Lord, you know. That's really have my heart. I, I, was, uh, I was in high school, and there were, it was when um, we were breaking down the wall over there, and um, the Berlin Wall was falling down, and, and one of our evangelists was over there. He baptized over 100,000 people, and he said there aren't enough people that want to save the lost. And for me, that's what this is all about. So if, right before Rico came out here, I wanted to work for the Lord. I went and added a bunch of science to my, I thought I could do it that way. But, and then I was, there's, the, there's these um, other schools I was going to go to instead of, I didn't know about Rico, and this was all about to happen. So I started to go to these schools to learn natural remedies. And if you've done this, these other people are uh, into uh, spiritualism big time and they have all the tinctures set up and one place I went to over here in La Jolla I went to this guy's house and he went down in his um, his house where he has these classes and he opened up the wall where all his tinctures are and you have to know the Latin on all the different weird herbs around there it's basically basically witchcraft and they fill it all with alcohol they're 95 percent proof this guy was an alcoholic and you could tell by, by the look of his face and also he goes and smokes a peyote and all this stuff and then i meet this other lady in his house who's into reiki well if you know anything about that it's highly into spiritualism so that's like on a on a tuesday and i'm and i'm start arguing with the lord if anybody have an argument with the lord i'm like but Lord, I can just I can just take the good out of it, you know, and I don't need to get into the bad stuff. I really want to do this this medical missionary stuff, and I had this argument for three or four days, and then Sabbath morning, my worship was actually I went through and the Bible and the healings of the Bible, and then I go to church, and somebody tells me about this seminar where Rico's go going to, you know, and boom, it was my answer just lined up, you know, and God won that argument, <laughs> and I went there, and I'm telling you the. You know, you've heard Rico here today, and some of you who have known Rico uh, at, for the last three years, you know, great guy. We love him. He's just, he's got such a friendly, such a friendly guy. We love Rico. And so, yeah, I did this, I did the, the chat training, and then we, was, we were on the prayer group, and I decided, you know, I'm just going to do it. And Carol points out to me that this is a cycle of evangelism. I know that, but, but. I didn't see anybody doing it, so I said, I'm just going to do it. So my, my dad and I did it, and I can count him right. We had five people show up for the, for the first seminar. But, but when it's, you know, Richard came with Wilma, so then we got to do it here a second time. And I, I'll just say that the chat training is such a blessing, too, because uh, it is a, it's such a spiritual activity. And besides for learning all about how to heal people, the part where you just come closer to Christ. I mean, how, how many of you have read uh, Ministry of Healing? That book, I read that book, it's okay. After you go through the training, chat training, that book, it lights up like fire. You will, you will just underline everything in that book. It's amazing. And the other thing Rico did was, I called him up, I lost a couple of slides. I called him up like 15 minutes before I had to do the presentation. He sent this stuff to me. I lost, it got erased on my laptop twice and <laughs> call him up and he just gets it right to me you know so it's great you know i just i just love chat and i'm telling you we do this because it's the right arm of the gospel right the medical missionary work with the gospel meeting people's felt needs and when you get some of these natural things and you see them really working on people it's it's amazing right carol's has done that don jenkins gave me some other ones that for healing wounds it's it's amazing and you start passing that around to people, they, it's a really great response, you know? So, anyway. Thank you for that. Um, so, the, anybody who is interested in kind of coming in and joining, you can still come in and you can do the training. If you're feeling God calling you to do it, then don't say no. Just don't say no, because Pastor Larry McGill had a quote that my Larry and I quote to each other all the time. I still remember where we were sitting in church when we looked up and it was on the slide. And on the slide it said, God says, if you do it my way, you won't be disappointed. Just, 
I heard another pastor who said, you know, when you get up in the morning, just say yes. Just say yes. Get it over with. He's going to ask you to do something. Just tell him, okay, I'm there. My Larry and I say, well, we're up, we have our uniforms on, and we're reporting for duty. Uh, I heard a pastor who was said to be very flexible. Uh, it was a compliment to him saying, this is the most flexible man we've ever known. And his response was, you have to be flexible. You don't want the devil to know exactly what you're doing. And so I don't mind if the if the program changes at the last minute, because then he's over here trying to set up a trap for me, and we're going this way. And that's kind of the same thing with Traday. I told Traday, there is nothing that could have kept you, gotten you through that detour this morning um, and to be here to talk to church, because that wasn't on God's agenda. It was just on my little cell phone list. It wasn't on God's agenda. He would not let her. I mean, what was it? 125 toll road shut down. Come on. When does that happen? And so what she's supposed to do is later, when Rico talks specifically to those of us who have been trained in chat or want to join chat, and he's going to talk to us kind of about next steps and where do we go from here, that's when today's testimony, her chat story, needs to come because she has something about that particular point. And so we just got to be flexible. Just God is doing something here. I keep seeing the movements, the movements, the movements. Do you know what? A group of us had, th there's a group called Backcountry Connections, people who live in the backcountry. There's like 25 families out there. They didn't even know each other. Seventh-day Adventist families. And we've been getting together because we figure it's the time of the end. We need to know each other. And so we've been getting together since March, about every six weeks. And um, six, eight weeks ago, we had some, uh, some of our colleagues who live in Boulevard on the Manzanita Indian Reservation. We met at one of the people's homes, and she invited the tribal chairwoman and the, one of the tribal chairmen to come. And they came, and they ex talked to us about the Kumeyaay Indians. They talked to us about the history um, we said, tell it to us straight. We know it's going to be ugly, but just tell us. We've got to hear it. It was a powerful, powerful meeting. And we have been wanting to go back, Vicki and I, to tell them thank you for this wonderful presentation they made to us. And we have been trying to get a meeting to take them a healthy self book and the cookbook that goes along with it. And it didn't work. And it didn't work and it didn't work. But along the way, when we had a phone call with Rico about a month ago, we were planning this, and he said, well, my next appointment is until the next weekend, so I could give you Monday and Tuesday. If you need me, I, I could have that available for you. So we send out a call, like, probably Thursday morning, and I asked um, our, 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 our backcountry connection people up on Ma in Boulevard on Manzanita Reservation. Hey, talk to the tribal chair. We asked for an appointment. We haven't heard back. Ask for Monday. Rico's going to be in town. Maybe we can gift them with the Healthy Self book, and then we'll take the author of the book with us. What would that be like? She texts me last night and says, we've got an appointment Monday afternoon. Come on. That is only God. Who could orchestrate that? We figured we'd be meeting with her a month ago. No, no, no. And so today, no, no, no. At, um, God's in charge. Just, just say yes. <laughs> it's just uh, an improvement on the camera angle. <laughs> Anyone here who might have been asked to do special music that I don't know about? Any last minute volunteers? <clears throat> All right, well, we will commence with um, Rico and what God's put on your heart. Well, good afternoon, everyone. 
This is such a blessing. Pastor, thank you so much again. Uh, you mentioned that the Lord would give me energy. I am, I, I don't, my battery doesn't wear out when giving God's word. It doesn't until I get back to the hotel and I'm done. <laughs> but it's a blessing. You know, I, I, I heard some reliable sources on research, scientific research. They say that when a pastor preaches, it's the equivalent of working eight hours, pastor. One sermon is the equivalent of eight hours of labor, of work, because you pour so much into it emotionally, physically, and if you're like me, walking around everywhere, it's probably 10 hours. But nonetheless, when I'm sharing the word of God, there's nothing like it. Where's Trude? Is she here? Trude? Oh, there you are. She and I were talking after this morning's uh, service, and she was um, just inquiring about some things. And, and I said, you know, it's, it's only the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, that gives you power. It gives you utterance. And that's what I really want to talk about this afternoon is the power of the Holy Spirit. And what does righteousness by faith look like? How many of you are familiar with righteousness by faith? What does it mean to you? What does it mean? Let me ask that question of you before we get started. I'll have a word of prayer and then we'll get into our talk this afternoon. Righteousness by faith. You know, it's been something that has been spoken of in this church for a long time. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the 1888 message? Let me see your hands. 1888 message? Yay, nay, I see your... You don't remember what it was? Okay. There was a great controversy. There was a great controversy. And what I want to do this afternoon is I want to show you why it's so controversial still to this day and many who are within the seventh day adventist church don't even know what it is and yet we are told that it is the message that brings about the end so you understand why jesus delays so every opportunity i get and especially the fact that i have the understanding of it as it relates to the health message it's important that we infuse the health message with righteousness by faith. There's a statement that is found in the third volume of the testimonies that says, make plain natural law and urge the obedience of it. For it is the work that is to accompany the third angel's message and to prepare, prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. Did you hear what I just said? I'm just quoting from volume three of the testimonies. It says, make plain natural law and urge the obedience of it, for it is the work that is to accompany which angel's message? The third angel's message, which comprehends all of them. The third angel's message, which is to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. So how can you, how can we be prepared for the coming of the Lord if we do not know A, the health message, and B, righteousness by faith, which is also what Ellen White says is the third angel's message. You know, she was asked the question, is it? And she says, oh, it is, absolutely. And we're gonna look at that today. But I want you to think and consider with me as we Bring that blood back up from the stomach from lunchtime. Bring it back up to your mind, to your brain, and I want you to consider with me. What is righteousness by faith? I want to hear from you. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, she is quoting. Christ in us, the hope of glory. My sister. Ah, very good. Well, she, she's quoting from Genesis and she's quoting from Hebrews. Old and New Testament, as it is said that, Jesus, do you know the first time that 
the word amen was used as was used with Abraham because it says when God told him I want you to grab your family and I want you to go to a, a place that I'm going to show you later on and he's he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness and the word there the Hebrew word there is aman and aman is where we get the word amen so if someone says Amen? You're saying, I believe. So really, it just comes down to believing. Hmm. Dennis. Righteousness by faith. Right, that's the question on the table. Righteousness by faith. What is it as you understand it? You ask the Lord for forgiveness, and that's... Amen, amen. My brother in the back. Ah. Righteousness by faith is obedience to all the commandments of God. Now, you are setting us up right there from testimonies to ministers and gospel workers in that book. You're smiling. I think I see you smiling behind your mask. Your eyes look like they're twinkling. In that book, it says that God sent a most precious, a most precious message to his people. This is in Testimonies TM, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 91 and 92, just in case you want the reference. It says, the Lord sent a most precious message to his people through Jones and Wagner. It was a message that was to uplift Christ as our surety and as our Savior. But then it says something, and I'm just piggybacking on what the brother said. It says that it was to cause the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which would manifest in the keeping of all the commandments of God. Now, which one came first? Was it the keeping of God's commandments or the receiving of the righteousness of Christ? According to that statement, I believe the Holy Spirit inspired that statement from Ellen G. White, and it, God, who's a God of order, it is placed in the order in which it should happen. And I need to let you know something about myself. When I came into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I believed that it was only the keeping of the commandments of God, that that was righteousness, and that I could make myself righteous by doing so. Mm. I got myself in trouble. Because I thought that all I had to do was keep the Sabbath like they told me to, eat a certain way like they told me to, dress a certain way like they told me to, and I was checking all those boxes. Does this sound familiar to anybody? And no one, listen, no one ever told me about receiving the righteousness of Christ. No one. Hadn't read it, didn't hear it, never saw it. Imagine my surprise when I saw that before I was supposed to be struggling and striving and working my way to heaven, that I was supposed to receive something. Does this sound familiar to anybody? I believe that it resonates with you because it resonates with most people. I have a lot of friends having a show on 3ABN. I have a lot of friends on, at 3ABN. They answer calls. They have a prayer line. Do you know that the number one call that they get from people calling in, they say some 50%. Guess what it's about? People who have 50%. People who watch 3ABN all the time, leave it on in their house, on television, all day long. Zero assurance in their salvation. The other 50%? Assurance in their salvation because of their works. We have a problem in our church. Today we want to solve it. I still want to hear from a few of you. What is your understanding of this wonderful message that came in the year 1888 to Jones and Wagner and was presented and then caused a stir? Yes. Ah, you're quoting Ellen G. White. That's what she said. It is the three angels' message in verity. Now, we need to know what that means. 
of a truth. It is the three angels' messages. Yes, sir. that he can receive the righteousness of Christ. Amen, brother. Amen. Yes. You've given him your life, and you can be saved based on his righteousness. Good, good, good. We have an, uh, a very strong foundation to go forward. Lots of answers, and they're all good answers, but today you're going to get the answer as it pertains to the health message, the right arm of the gospel. Amen? Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the goodness of our God. The God who desires to bring us home, to be with him forever. I don't know why. When I look at my own life and I look at the lives of so many, one wonders why you love us so much. But you do. The quick answer is you are love. That's just who you are. But I know this. Those who are here today, this afternoon, myself included, we have a desire to know of this love and to spend eternity learning about the great atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, how God became a man and dwelt among us and stopped at nothing to save us. We want to know you. Let today be a stepping stone in learning about this Jesus is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. That is the three angels' messages that we've talked about a few times here. Revelation chapter what chapter? 14. And beginning in verse 6, the Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, verse 7, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him who made heaven and earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. And then we see that another angel speaks in verse 8. Babylon is fallen. Is fallen. It says it twice. It says it twice. The first thing you need to know and understand is where is the health message? Or ask yourself, where is the health message in that? Give glory to God. You're connecting that with um, Corinthians. Yes, yes, yes. Where Paul says, whatsoever you do, eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Yes, yes, yes. So you, you hear the health message being alluded to there. But let's go deeper. The Bible tells us that God created all things. And for that reason, Revelation chapter 4, it tells us there that you are worthy of our praise because you created all things. Amen? And God, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 14, under the first angel's message, that we are to fear God. Why? Because he created all, all things. That is one of the reasons. But the other reason is he's done something else. By the way, who helped him do that? Who helped Jesus to do all this creative work? Who? Angels helped him? 
Well, the Bible just says, speaks it very clearly. It says, he, Jesus Christ created all things. And it was placed in the hands of the Son to create all things. So Jesus did all the work. He spoke. He commanded. And it stood fast, the Bible tells us in Psalm 34. Right? So God did it all. But don't miss the critical thing that's in the first angel's message. What am I talking about? Let's quote it again. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell. Stop me when you hear it. Let me say it again. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the ever The what? The everlasting gospel. What is the everlasting gospel? Is that what the everlasting gospel is? It's fearing God. And we know this, that's not being afraid of him. But that's the next quotation in verse 7. But what is the everlasting gospel? Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. Somebody go there and read it. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 tells you what the everlasting gospel is. Because the everlasting gospel, that word everlasting in, in and of itself, tells you something about it, doesn't it? What is it what? Read it though. Because, it, you know, if, if it was just a lamb dying, that's one thing. But there's something else there that's very important. Slain from when? From the foundation of the world. You need to understand, we need to understand as gospel medical missionaries, that's right, I called you that, gospel medical missionaries, you need to understand that there are two things that are bookends that you rely upon and I rely upon, and that number one, it is the fact that Jesus Christ created all things by himself, you didn't help. And he redeemed you even before you were you. Is that true? Before you were thought of, before you existed, Jesus Christ made the decision. You'll find that in uh, Zechariah chapter 8, 6. Zechariah chapter 6, where it says that the meeting or the council was between the Father and the Son. And what council was that? It was the council when they got together and they decided, if this thing goes awry, what do we do? And Jesus said, I'll go. No human beings created, no existence, none of the things that we see in Genesis 1, 2, or 3. Jesus says, before it even happened, I'm going. I'm going. I'll go. So righteousness by faith. Here's a definition, working definition. I'm, I'm, I'm a little handicapped because I'm not close to my slides. Can you... Can you Go forward with my slides, please. I like to call this um, councils on diet and not foods, but councils on diet and faith. Righteousness by faith. Yeah? Um, keep going. Next slide. Thank you so much. Next slide. Or, or rather, just give it a click. What happened? Ah, there it is. So... The question was asked in Faith I Live By, that's a devotional book, what is justification by faith? Now this was right around the time when the message of righteousness by faith was coming out and everybody wanted to know, well what is it? It's, it's caused such a brouhaha. We want to know what is justification by faith, righteousness by faith, Christ our righteousness, all of which are synonymous, they're interchangeable. Did you hear what I just said? Righteousness by faith, justification by faith, Christ our righteousness, all are synonymous. So the question was asked, what is justification by faith? And she gives the most inspired definition ever. It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. Oh, stay with me today. 
This is what righteousness by faith is. The work of God. Now, let me tell you, in 1888, they liked the second part, but they didn't like the first part. You didn't hear what I just said. What's the first part? Oh, you're not laying my glory in the dust. What you talking about? Don't you know I've been preaching for years? Don't you know I have gone to the seminary? Don't you know that I am a third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation? I'm an eighth generation, seventh day Adventist. That even doesn't even exist. But nonetheless, I'll say it because it sounds good. I am somebody for the Lord. Thank you very much. And here were two men who came forward and they were saying, you know what? There's something powerful in this message. And the message is simply that God is laying your glory in the dust. And when it all is evaluated in the final analysis of everything, we are no greater than beast. <laughs> and they were quoting the psalmist. They gave all these quotes. Man is like a flower. He's like dust. He just is like a vapor. He just is here and then he's gone. It's no big deal. And here were people who had started this movement and they couldn't bear being told that they weren't something that they believed they were. Oh, we'll take the part that he'll do for us that which is not in our power. He saves us, yes, redemption. But don't tell us that our glory is in the dust. And that was the problem. That's how our movement got started. Did you know this? Controversy. We've always had it. And it came back again in 1924, and it came back, and they asked, they were like, this is ridiculous. Let's just go ahead and commission somebody to write a book on it. So they got A.G. Daniels, who was the president of the Adventist Church back there in the early part of the 20th, 20, 20th century. He wrote a book called Christ, Our Righteousness. And it gave all the history through the Bible of the righteousness of Christ. All of the quotations that were given by Ellen G. White. Go to the next slide. Watch this. It quotes this one from Review and Herald, September 3rd, 1889. This was a decade of controversy. It's still coming out. And notice what she says. There is not one in 100 who understands for himself the Bible truth on this subject, justification by faith that is so necessary to our present and what else? Eternal welfare. So, no, so you need it now and you need it when? Okay. Let me slow down. Are you with me so far? What I am hoping today that you'll get such a clear understanding that when someone says, like Sister Carol, um, Carol said, wake up in the morning and you just say yes, when you understand that, wait a minute, what can I do for God? Tell me what it is. I'm ready. I understand that everything is, is coming to a close. This is done. There's a statement from Ellen G. White where she says, man was created, watch this, are you ready for this, to touch your heart? Because we were needed. That don't even sound right, do it? You were created because God needs you. I thought I needed God. No, he needs you. Oh, we need him. We know that's understood. But he also needs you. Individual. Terrell. Terrell. <laughs> he needs you. He needs you. And anything that you would do that would lessen your usefulness in his hands is a sin. He can't afford to have people who are not everything that they can be for his glory. In every possible way. Quick mind, sharp mind. He takes Moses, 80 years old he takes him. He's already 80 years of age. And he takes him and says, Moses, you're going to go liberate the people in Egypt. Well, I'm 80 and I can't even talk straight. <laughs> Do you not know that I made man's tongue? <laughs> All right, fine, I'll send your brother Aaron with you. Just go. You're going to lead a million plus people out of Egypt. Don't tell me what God can't do. Moses wasn't even ready to die when he told him to go up to Mount Nebo. He said, go up there and just lay down and die. Huh. 
The Bible says that his eyes weren't even dim. So righteousness by faith is not well understood. Now, if she says there's not one in 100, whew, 1889. Not one in 100. What do you think the number is now? Oh, so we're talking about a grimace. Jamie, thank you. That was very visual. What do you think it is now? One in what? 200? 10,000, that's all? All right, let me give you this next statement. Let me see the next slide. Next slide. Next slide. God is good. God is good. Watch this. This is the continuation. Oh, they really don't like this. This is the continuation from Faith I Live By, page 111, paragraph 2. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. All right, I got to stop right here. What do y'all think about that? I want to know. Because, you know, what if I ask a question like I normally do before I get to this quotation, I usually ask the question, are you something or are you nothing? And since I didn't ask you, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what you would have said. I ask people, are they something or are they nothing? Or somewhere in between. Some people play it safe and they say somewhere in between. But no one, no one says I'm nothing. Now, I don't mean what your value is in the eyes of God. I don't mean that. In the eyes of God, we know from Calvary's cross that you are everything. You hear me? Everything. But in and of yourself, what are you? How do you perceive yourself? How do you think, what do you think of yourself? Well, back in 1888, Men who had been preaching the message for a long time, they thought that they were everything. They were the greatest thing since sliced bread. And to tell them that they weren't anything, nothing, huh, it was not easy for them to handle. You had your hand up, sister. Are we live streaming? Are we streaming? I think we might need, just for the benefit of those who are listening, we might need a microphone. Damien, you maybe can help us with that, like I helped you in Sabbath school. <laughs> but for right now, I will repeat your question or comment. Go ahead. Like these people in this room. That's what he wants. Why? It gives glory to God and not us. He can't use you if you've had all these things. Now, and that's not to say that he cannot, but nine times out of ten, he give me some shepherds. Give me somebody who was pushing the plow. Give me somebody who doesn't really think anything of themselves. Give me someone like Isaiah who says, Lord, I am undone. I can't go. Yeah, you can go. That's what I want. Tell me that you can't. Tell me that you have no skill. Tell me that you're unqualified to do it. That's when I can use you. Give me some fishermen. We've completely turned that upside down. I hate to say it. I work among people who feel as though you have to reach some certain degree of something. But God is like, what? All of that stuff, I'm going to have you unlearn anyway. What do you mean you're going to have me unlearn? Let me tell you something. When God's in the midst when he's working, he'll tell you to take an iron axe and throw it in the water and watch it float. Then you give me some signs to help you do that. Are you listening to me today? The first thing I want you to know about righteousness by faith is that God wants your nothingness. He wants your nothingness. He wants the unwise so that he can confound. <laughs> What? Who is this person that they, they, they have talking in front of us? It's, it's, tell me what his pedigree is. Tell me the list of credits he has. Tell me his resume. He just came off the street. He used to be a farmer. What? Why is he speaking to us? I don't know. Let's listen to him. <laughs> then they preach and you're like, whoa. We haven't heard it on this while. That's when Jesus, when he came, when Jesus came, they said, who is this man with no letters? Who is he? He's, did he go to our schools? No, he didn't go to our schools. Why are we listening to him? Because he's got the words of life. 
Huh? God wants your nothingness. This is righteousness by faith. Now, let's get down to the, to the, the brass tacks. Now, what is righteousness? Give me the next slide. Now, is, are we clear on this? That God wants you to be nothing. Are you? <laughs> we're about to go to the next slide, but... No, go, go back. I don't want... They'll start reading. Go back for a minute. Thank, go back for a second. Go back to the previous one. They'll start reading, and I don't want them to read. Not yet. I just want to make sure. Are you okay being nothing? Don't lie to me. <laughs> don't lie to me. Are you okay being nothing? Amen. That means everything... If I've told you this story before, it doesn't matter. It's a good story. There was a man. He had sent all of his kids through Christian education, through the academies, through college, and all of that. For 40 years, he was the elder in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And he came to church on one fateful Sabbath, and someone was preaching like I'm preaching to you right now about these things and telling him that he was basically nothing and that his righteousness was, as Isaiah said, Filthy what? Rags. So when he heard this, he, usually a very gregarious man, someone who's very social and outgoing and stuck around and, you know, loved to, you know, talk it up at the potlucks and all this, he was unusually quiet, Carol. Not a word from him that day. Why? He had just been told that everything that he had done for God was nothing quiet so he gets back home his wife and another friend they prepare the sabbath meal he's still quiet they put the meal in front of him and just before they pray he speaks up and he says you know that old preacher that's how he said it that old preacher is right everything i've done for the last 40 years is worth nothing and as if rehearsed, the wife and the friend at the exact same time said, that's right. And he went back to being quiet. In fact, he was quiet for the next three weeks. Nobody heard from him at church. He wouldn't talk. He was just so absolutely disturbed by this idea. And I'm telling you, friends, the reason why Jesus has not come is because too many of us in this church fall in one of the categories. Either we think that everything that we've done has somehow helped God and counts for something, merits something, gives us some credit in heaven, or we're not sure. The solution is found in righteousness by faith. There are some of us who are arguing over, do you eat this? Oh, I eat that. I'm a Paul. I'm a... And Lord help us, we even have some arguments over, are you a Democrat? <laughs> I'm a Republican. I'm hearing something that might be a little distracting. Is there something on? If you could just turn it down just a little bit, I think behind, behind you, I think, the kids. But even some who are arguing over this I'm conservative. I'm liberal. You're liberal. This righteousness by faith is the answer, is the solution. Are you ready for this next slide? Watch this. Next slide. Watch this. The thought that righteousness, that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, is a precious thought. Mm. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. For he knows that if the people receive it fully, what's going to happen? His power will be broken. What power? What power? Deceptive power? What else? His stronghold... What else? What, when Jesus came as the, the embodiment of righteousness by faith, what hold did he break? What thing did he destroy? What was it? You just mentioned it. First Corinthians chapter 15. Death. 
disease, everything. When people of God, like Jesus, recognize their own, how in the world did Jesus come from heaven, the panoply of heaven, the power of God, come down to this earth and consider himself nothing? You couldn't argue it. You can't. You can argue it. He made sure everything lined up. In every instance, he showed the world, I'm nothing, but I'm powerful with the Holy Spirit. Didn't he kept his power, his divinity in his back pocket like I've got my hotel room key. He had it right back here and never took it out. Did you hear what I just said? Not once did he take it out. He said, I'm going to make sure that they know that I'm nothing. I'll come to a little place called Bethlehem. Just like the prophecy said, I'll come there and I'll grow up in Nazareth where people are nice and rich, right? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I'm going to go there. And when I come through and they're ready to coronate me, I'm going to come not on a chariot, but on a donkey. This is the God we serve. And he's the one that he says, this is the example that I've given for you. When they say, well, where do you live? Come on, I'll show you. The foxes have holes. I've got a few foxes in my backyard. They got a nice little setup over there under some fallen tree. Jesus says, they got a place to live. I don't. I, I want you all to just think about that. Just let that just sit in, sink in. See, we, we got it good. How many of you have houses? Mm. Comfortable beds. I thank God every day. Thank you for the roof over my head. Thank you for the clothes on my back. Thank you for the food on my table. Thank you for a comfortable, a comfortable place to sleep. I'm thankful for it because I know when he came, he didn't have it. He depended on the kindness of others so that you and I could make no mistake that he came as nothing. Yet he was the most powerful man who ever walked this planet. And somehow we think that we're going to go and get degrees and get all this training and all these things and we're going to come forth and do something for God? No, brothers and sisters. Righteousness by faith, believing in what God can do through you when you're nothing. Because the moment we accept it, what's going to happen? We're going home. We're going home. This is a dangerous message. It's a dangerous message. I know it is. That's why I have to say, Lord, cover me with your blood. Cover me with your righteousness. Cover me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Because I'm going to go tell them the very formula for winning and getting this done with. And if anybody accepts it fully, what's going to happen? We'll get the power over Satan and over death. And San Diego will be turned upside down. And people will be wondering, how in the world did that happen? Do you understand this? If we change the paradigm, all we have to do is change the paradigm. And first in our own minds to start to believe, you know what? God will do something through my nothingness. God will do something through my foolishness. God will take my, my weakness and he will manifest his strength. And then people will say, how did they do it? And you will say, not I, but Christ. You'll say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives where? And the life which I now live in the, by the, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the righteousness by, of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is righteousness? Here we go. What is righteousness? Now that we've got an understanding of righteousness by faith, now that we've got an understanding that most people don't even know what it is, now that we have an understanding that the world can come to an end and we can overcome all these things if we just accept our own worthlessness or nothingness, but exalt our willingness to be filled by him. You're going to tell me what righteousness is. You know what? You are, you are correct. That's the secondary answer, though. I like to say it's the secondary answer because there's a, there is a primary answer. There's a primary 
um, understanding that we should, we should have before we get to doing, right, doing the work. Because what propels you? What is it that motivates you to do what's right? Because I know you're quoting from Ellen G. White. She says, right, she says righteousness is right doing. But what, what, what would make you do right? Ah, I love this class. This is a good class. If you ever want to come and teach it, it's good. Good class. It's love. Now, where are you getting that from? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are... Uh, uh, Amen. Amen. Good. Wow. Now, see, I had you sized up all wrong. I said she's been a good Christian Adventist all her life. Oh, I love you, sister. I just love you. I'm, I, I hear you. Do you hear her passion? Do you hear her love? Do you hear how real that is? I am, it's so refreshing because I'm so used to people who are, have done good all their lives. And they feel like, you know what? <laughs> I've earned my, I got my ticket. I got it punched. Everybody must be born again. And this sister right here has been born again, and she recognizes. I also got appreci appreciation for this brother. I'll share what you said in a, a few moments. Maybe you'll share yourself, but you were about to make a point. Oh, yeah. microphone's coming to you. Wow. Okay, so if you missed what the sister said, she said that she was a drug addict. How long? Four or five years, and, and God, the Redeemer, the Savior, rescued her. And that's why she loves him. She knows him as a redeeming Lord. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, Brother Gary. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay. What is it? What is it you want us to understand from, from that? Well, that he said we're all nothingness. Uh, we can't. We can't. We don't deserve anything but death. That's all uh, we deserve. And 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 Christ. And we earned it too, didn't we? Because the wages of <laughs> sin, sin is death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and Christ took it all on His shoulders, and and took on Himself what we deserved, and gave us what he deserved. Paul says he, he who knew no sin became sin, sin for, for us, us that we might become the righteousness, righteousness of God through him. I love that. You know what? If you ever want to understand righteousness by faith, you can clearly understand it from that text in 1 Corinthians where it says he who knew no sin became sin for us. Was Christ a sinner? Did he ever commit a sin? No. But he became sin, even though he never was sinful. Cursed is the you, man. Hold on, hold on a second. Hold on a second. You, in like manner, watch this. You become righteous, even though you've never been it. It's an exchange. You understand? You, it, it's it's so clear in that text. He who knew no sin. The Bible is very careful to make sure that you understand that he knew no sin. He never sinned in the same way that you've never been righteous. But he became that and he exchanged it. Give me your sin. He takes it upon himself and he says, here, take this. And now, in all of your nothingness, when people see you, they see the righteousness of God in you. I hope they see it. Does that make sense to you? Is that understandable teaching? Let's begin to just bring this to a close. All right, I was asking you the question, what is righteousness? And I heard a few answers. We arrived at this love. Do you have any Bible or spirit of prophecy support for that? There was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. <laughs> Can you change it a little bit? the right thing because of love but remember I gave you testimonies to ministers 
The statement, a, pre a precious message was given to this church, 1888, and that message was for the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which would be manifest, manifested, or which would manifest the keeping of all God's commandments. So in other words, something happened in the reception that now made me want to keep the commandments. But it wasn't the other way around. It wasn't like I'm keeping the commandments and now I'm righteous. Something happened. And now I want to do it. Imagine what the world would be like. Imagine what our church would be like if people actually, because they received something and they understood what they got, it would be different. Okay, let me, let me just, anybody ever read this wonderful book called Mount of Blessings? Mount of Blessings? Oh. You know, it's so hard to say, Carol, that you have a favorite. Desire of Ages, you talk about that. Oh, that's my favorite book. If you bring up Christ's Object Lessons, I would say, oh, yeah, that's my favorite book. <laughs> you bring a Mount of Blessings, yeah, that, that too, yeah, my favorite. But I realize I can't have all favorites. They can't all be favorites, right? In, in Mount of Blessings, or Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings is the whole name, page 18, paragraph 1. In that book, it says, righteousness is love. And love is the light and the life of God. We receive, or rather Christ, the next sentence says, Christ, or all the embodiment of, of righteousness was in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving him. So what is righteousness? No, no. It's love. Righteousness is love. Now, now, before I go any further, let me show you in the Bible, because whenever I show something that's that important, I'd like for you to know it from the spirit of prophecy and from the Bible. And in the Bible, you'll find it in, um, if I said, let me just make sure that you, we're all tracking this together. In Ephesians, it says, put on the whole armor of God. And if I said, put on the breastplate of righteousness so right now the bible is an expositor its own expositor it tells you and it defines itself and it says that the breastplate is is the part of the armor that goes upon the chest and it is righteousness right yes. the same author paul he in first corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8 turned there very quickly and let's have the bible don't you love how the bible explains itself Amen. don't you love that you don't have to guess. You don't have to go to some commentary. It's right there in the Word of God. Notice what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter, 1, chapter 5 and verse 8. When you're there, say amen, please. Does someone have a King James Version that they could read that for us? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8. Gary, you have the microphone right beside you. Please read to us what the Bible says is righteousness. Was that to me? Okay. Five, verse eight. But let us, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. So, what is the breastplate of what is the breastplate of righteousness, also known as, according to inspiration, love. faith and love. So, righteousness is love, and when you have the love of God in your heart then you will do right. Come on, brother. You'll do right. You'll do the right things. You'll find that ministry that God has laid out and has outlined for us to finish the work understands this that I'm sharing with you today. Does that make sense? The, the, if you don't remember anything else, that I've said to you today, and I pray that you will remember the, the heart and soul of what I'm sharing, because I'm telling you, friends, I'm in this for the long haul. I am fully expecting, fully expecting to go forth as a conqueror, more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Not because of any skills I have, I have none. I'm not even a speaker. I'm not even a preacher. I'm not. 
I mean that. People say I am, but I'm not. I'm a very shy person. I was that person, the little kid, who if I saw somebody come down the street who was going to try to talk to me for a few minutes, I would cut through the alley because I was too shy to just have a conversation. I'll never forget. I'm so shy I could never get up and speak in front of people, ever, growing up. I remember in the third grade we did a play. You remember that play with the, the salesman and his, the peddler or something, and his hats and the monkeys took it and went up the tree or something like that? They read that book and all of it. Well, anyway, my third grade class, we did it. And our, you know, the peddler went through and he was selling his hat for sale, hat for sale, hats for sale. And we were strategically placed on the ends of the aisles. And what we were supposed to do was to stand up and buy a hat from him. And all the other kids, they stood up just as we rehearsed it. But when they got to me, he stood right in front of me, John, hats for sale, and I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Hats for sale. My, my teacher's sitting right next to me. I'll never forget her name. Her name was Mrs. Downs, and she's giving me the elbow. Get up, get up, get up, and buy a hat. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I'm sharing that with you because I came from nothing. And now I speak all over this world. But I recognize I'm broken. I recognize that I don't have anything except my willingness to do it. And then God says, I can work with that. So I recognize that all of us have different things in our lives that have caused us to be, you know, mm, that's for somebody else. That's outside of my comfort zone. That's really not me. We come up with all those kinds of reasons. But I want you to know today that all you have to do is say, Lord, I can't do that. And then God says, perfect. Perfect. I have no ability. Perfect. Because when you start to do it, they're going to say, because, you know, for now, for me, the person who didn't get up and buy a hat in the third grade, people who mem remember me from those days, and they see me on YouTube, and they're like, what? <laughs> Ain't he the one that didn't get up when it was time to buy a hat? Yeah, that's him. What happened to him? And if I ever see them and they ask me, you know what I'm going to say? Not I, but Christ. But Christ who lives in me. Amen? Now let me just give you a few things as we, as we wrap this up. So righteousness by faith is what? It's faith and love. Do you have it? Okay, see, oh, now we got to start all over again. <laughs> got to start all over again. You missed it. All right. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. This will, this will solidify. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13. Turn there. When you're there, say amen. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13. This will answer the question. All you have to do is just know the logic of it, and it'll be beautiful to you, right? Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13. In Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13, the Bible says, For my people, is that the one you got? For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and have hewn out cisterns that can hold no water. Broken cisterns. Broken. Yeah, that's, that's key. You got to know they're broken because they can't hold water when they're broken, right? So you and I, we're just broken cisterns. We can't hold water. You understand this text? What is a fountain? Yeah, that's a good theological answer. But, I mean, in, in the most practical, utilitarian, if was that... A fountain holds water. It delivers. Why? I'm looking for a word. I love you. That's why I like you so much. Come on. It's the source. Did you hear what she said? It's the source. Jesus proclaims himself the fountain of living water. If you got some water, guess what? You're the broken cistern. You receive the water from the source. He says, you're broken, but I'll fix you that you'll hold the water. But you got to come to me to get it.
But guess what we have done as a church? We get it from everywhere else. And we say it's still God's fountain. See, that's the Holy Spirit, right? Remember that? John says, out of them shall flow fountains of water, streams of water, right, of living water. He's the living water. And if you understand he's the source, listen very carefully. You will understand righteousness by faith and the power thereof. He's the source. And if righteousness is love, you have to be okay with this. You're human, we're broken, and you have no love. This will help your marriage. The problem with a lot of marriages is that people are trying to say what love is and trying to define it, and they never had it. Oh, they learned about it from romance novels, from rom-coms or romantic comedies. You've got mail. They've learned it from all manner of sources, and it distorts what we think what love is, but we don't have a clue. God defines love as one thing. No greater love is there than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. Now, when we hear that, we say, I, I, you know what? I've got some really good friends. A few of them I might even be willing to die for. We would say that until we go back and look at the life of Christ and the people who were slapping him. Those weren't good friends. Snatching his beard out of his face, not good friends. Spitting upon him. You die for somebody like that? Would you? The answer is no. I'll help you out. You wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it. Not only would you not die for them, after you die for them, you would never come back and say, or even while you're, after they just did it, say, I forgive you. You wouldn't do it. Anybody have that kind of love? Be honest. Anybody have that love? Anybody? We don't have it. So in order to do this work, to prosecute this work, to do this work fully, the reason why it's so powerful when you recognize that you don't have it and you go to the source and fill up every day, you fill up on that love because you don't possess it and then you go and you give it to somebody. That's what heaven's going to be like doesn't make sense to the human mind, but that's what it is. Okay, so now let's go back. What is righteousness by faith? Righteousness is love. Righteousness by faith is having faith in the one who has the love and imputes and imparts to you that love, and you don't have it. But he gives it to you for what purpose? To give it to someone else. And if I give it to you and say, you know what, brother, God bless you, and you turn around, you give it to him, and he turns around, he gives it to her and to him, and then this is how it works. It's really simple. This is how the gospel works. We have too many ministries, too many churches who believe that they somehow have this love that doesn't exist among the human family. It doesn't exist. It has never existed, save in the life of Christ. That's the only place it has ever existed, and he has now said, receive it. And it's so simple. Here, take it. Turn to Romans chapter 5. I'm going to say a few things about end-time events, give you a few examples from the Bible, and then we're going to close or add, take a few questions. I'm hoping that you are hearing something today. How many people, has anyone counted? Carol, has you counted? Have you counted the number of people? And I love what you said, Carol. You said you are seeing multiple churches here. This is what finishes the work. 
It's when you have people from this church and that church and across the cross town and you all are of one mind. You all understand this one thing that we've been talking about today and you, you pull your resources, you bring yourselves together and you say, you know what? We understand how we're going to finish this work. We understand how we're going to turn San Diego upside down now. And you keep studying and you keep planning and strategizing and using the resources that are made available to you. And I tell you, you've been praying for three and a half years, Carol. You said it's been seeded. That means it's time to harvest. It's time to harvest. And there will be such a harvest. God is just waiting for you to step into the gathering, the reaping. It's time. Romans chapter, what did I say? You're paying attention. Romans chapter 5. Notice what, this is so beautiful. Go to the next slide. I might have it on, on up here. Let me see. Go to the next slide. I may have it. Keep going. Next slide. No, go back. Nope. Thought I put it in there. Okay, Romans chapter 5. I want you to see something. It's so beautiful and it's so clear. Romans chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 8. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Say it again. Whose favorite? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Watch this. Watch this. It says, for God who commanded what? Towards us in that while we were, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. That's a good verse. That's a good verse, Pastor. Verse 9. Verse 9 says, much, then, much more then, being now justified by his blood. Justified? Justified, that, is an, that word is interchangeable with what? Righteousness by faith. You are justified. You are made righteous by his shed blood. Yes? Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now look at verse 10. Watch the exchange. This is the thing that we miss. Oh, pastor, how beautiful is this? For if when we were enemies, anybody, anybody, anybody here ever been an enemy to God? Don't get all quiet on me now. You're still enemies of God. You don't just wake up and are all pious all day long. God doesn't even look at what's the stuff that you do. He looks at the stuff that's in your head. He looks at what's going on in your heart and your mind when somebody cuts you off. Yeah, don't, don't, I'm meddling now, aren't I? See, I, I have to do that to you because otherwise you're like, I haven't done anything. God doesn't care about what you do. He's looking at your heart. He doesn't judge man's actions in the way that we do. He judges your thoughts. And they're never good. You're probably struggling half the time just to keep a good thought in your head. I do that. I'm, I don't know about y'all. I'm being very honest. I'll start talking about somebody in my head. I'm like, uh-uh, no, you're not. You should hear me. I'm, going, I'm struggling with myself all the time. It, it, am I talking to somebody? I'm telling you, when, when we start... <laughs> Listen to me. When we are honest with ourselves, we will start to say, you know what? And you'll recognize it. You'll see it. And that's when you know that the Holy Spirit is there to stop you from that thought. But when you're just walking through your day, whatever, and you're thinking stuff, cursing people out in your head, calling them all sort of names in your head, you need some Holy Ghost. Because when Christ is in you, it doesn't happen. That's the most practical way that I can tell you that. When Christ is in you, you want to know those thoughts in your mind because the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, rightly dividing asunder even to the bone and marrow and the intents of the heart. Romans chapter, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The intents of the heart, that even what you intended, your motivation, God is reading it. And he's still saying, you're my child. One day, I'm going to fill you with my spirit, and you'll have none of those thoughts. 
Oh, I'm telling you, friends, the day is coming. The day is coming. The day is coming. The day is coming when you, if you do not have those things in check, and that's why one of the reasons why you need to get your diet right is because you will not be able to check those thoughts. You won't be able to. You will not be able to check those thoughts. And we find that back in the day when they knew Jesus was coming, when they knew it, the greatest thing was on their mind was, Lord, help me get rid of these thoughts. They spent all night out in barns praying and pleading, God, is there any more sin in me? I know you're coming. God needs a people who understands this. He's not looking at what you do. We are told that thoughts and feelings combined, that's what makes up the moral character. As a man thinks in his heart, as a man thinks in his heart, you may not think you are, but what you think, you are. That's what your character is at the level of your thoughts. Back to the text. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by what? I don't think everybody's there. This is, this is, this is the thing that we got to say. Let's, can we do this together? Here we go. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the... Much more being reconciled... Amen is right. Do you understand what you just read? Do you understand what you just read? This is the epitome of righteousness by faith. What does it mean? Hold on. The Bible tells us in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 17. It was a 1711. 1711? 1711. Help me out, Pastor, 1711 or 11 to 17. The word says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And see, blood is both substitutionary and it's sacrificial. You understand that? So when Christ died on the cross, that was a sacrifice. But the life was in that blood. What life? No, no spot, no blemish, only good. And he takes that blood and he covers you with it. So now, not only were you reconciled, ju reconciled, justified by his blood, but you're saved because of the 33 and a half years of a perfect life. That's what saves you. You want it? You want it? You want it? Anybody want it? How, have you, how has your life stood the test? How about 33 and a half years of a perfect life given to you, imputed and imparted, is yours? Now go forward with that. Go all the way with that. Whether you're translated or whether you actually, the Lord puts you to sleep before things happen, as it says in Isaiah 57. You didn't know that, did you? Isaiah 57 verse 1 says the exact same thing that the Ellen White with the Spirit of Prophecy says. She says that God's going to put some people to sleep because he knows that they cannot go through the time of test. Isaiah 57 verse 1 says the exact same thing. So some will be put to sleep because God has already looked at you and he says you can't make it. But then there are others who will go through a time of test like never before. Either way, whether you live or whether you die, says Paul, may it be done in Christ. Now let me just tell you a few things. Jesus says, as we close here to this evening, Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be with the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. They were planting, another place, planting and buying and selling. And they were doing all these things, which really just amounts to they were living life. Right? Marrying and giving in marriage. Do you see it? I want you to know the urgency, brothers and sisters. I want you to understand that. Do you see it? Marrying and giving in marriage, what does that mean? I never really fully meant, knew what it meant until I saw Jennifer Lopez and... Kim Kardashian, and I saw these people who just get married every year. Every year. And they're just like, oh, I don't like him anymore. And they marry somebody else. 
Have you noticed this? Marrying and giving in marriage. <clears throat> As it was in the days of Lot. What was in the days of Lot? All types of gender confusion. They got something now called monkeypox. <clears throat> Have you heard of this? Monkeypox. You know, do you know how it is transmitted primarily? Sexually transmitted, but sexually transmitted normal sex? What kind? Exactly. So now, so now watch the devil. Watch the devil. See, what you have to do is we have to be keenly aware of what the enemy is doing at all times. Your, your enemy, your adversary is like a roaring lion, lion looking for whom he may devour. And he's working around the clock. And he's doing things and some of it just passes by us. But don't let this one pass by you. Because what's happening is at the exact same time, listen, at the exact same time where people are saying that I'm non-binary and I use certain pronouns and don't call me a he and don't call me a she or I'm pansexual. Do you know what pansexual means? I'm attracted to anybody who has a personality that I like and they can be transgender, they can be male, they can be female. It doesn't matter to me. I just, it could be animal. I like the, what, the animal, right? It's bizarre, it's strange. I know, I understand, but watch what the devil's doing. So as people start to just have, you know, gender confusion and bi-curious and all these kinds of things, then everybody's just in one cesspool doing what they do and it spreads faster. You catch that? So where, whereas, whereas when it was just kind of like AIDS was just really confined to the homosexual area and they said, oh, San Francisco and these hot spots or whatever you would call them, quote unquote, now it's a free for all. Satan is moving very quickly, and the Bible tells us, not the Bible, but the Spirit of Prophecy tells us in Testimonies, Volume 11, I'm sorry, Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, it says, and the final rapid one, I mean, the final movements will be rapid, rapid ones, and we're seeing that things are happening rapidly, and we're seeing all these things happening, and they're very fast, things happening in the financial world. Did you know that when he says, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. With well, the coming of the Son of Man. What does the Bible tells, tell us in Genesis chapter 6? That there was something in the land. Violence. Do you know it's July? The last weekend of July. And we have had in the half of this year over 300 not murders but mass shootings. Over 300. And it's only going to get worse. I have now gotten to the place where I'm like, I don't just go into a public place and just chill and don't actually take notice of the exit doors and where I am. I don't do that anymore. You can't. You don't know when someone's just going to come in a Walmart and just start. You have no idea. But we're told you need to watch and pray. Watch and pray. Pay attention to the way marks. Look at what Jesus said. Do not overlook it. Jesus told you, before I come, these things are going to happen. It's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. And then when you get further information from patriarchs and prophets, it says, are you ready for this? In the days of Noah, the violence that was in the land where men would go and take other men's wives and they would just kill indiscriminately. That sound familiar? She says there was violence because God had, listen, she, God had given no permission for them to eat flesh foods and the flesh only made them more violent. So God had to destroy the earth. Why did God destroy the earth? Why did God destroy the earth with the antediluvians? We're thankful for that. And, and that is a part of the, the scenario, as it was in the days of Noah. There will be an ark, and I hope you're building it. Whew. 
That means his heart, his heart was grieving that he had taken this step. And the reason, the, the thing that grieved him so much, because death is a strange act to God. He's a God of life. He doesn't like destroying people, but he had to do it. But you all missed what I just said. The people were violent because of how they ate. And the more they ate from flesh foods and took that blood into their bodies, what took place was they become, because the life of the flesh is in the blood, their thinking, their minds became more like animals. They became more like animals. So all these things are happening. We're living in the last days, brothers and sisters, and we need, I don't care what the program you do, you can do some other program, but I know this, when I go from place to place, I'm seeing the fruit from chat, and I'm thankful for what you shared, and I'm just saying to those of you who are here, you need to be doing something. You decide, whatever God calls you to, but if you want something that's comprehensive, that really is organized, and has good leadership, and people who are committed, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself to be used by God in this program because you don't have a lot of time. You do not have a lot of time. Final thing I'll share with you. It goes back to where we started. Amen? You believe. The Bible tells us in Numbers chapter 11. In Numbers chapter 11, the Bible says there, that God presented to them a certain meal. I'm going to tell you all this, this real quick because it's so beautiful. It's God is the be most beautiful example of righteousness by faith. And I don't understand, I really don't understand why people don't catch how God is, what he's saying about food. The, the Bible is replete from cover to cover. He's talking about food and how it affects us. This is one that I never saw. In, in Genesis chapter 27, and I believe, believe it's in like verse 1. Don't go there. You don't have to go there. I'm just going to tell you the story. You can go read it for yourself later. But do you remember the story of, of Isaac and Esau and Jacob? Do you remember that? And in that story, he says, go get me some savory meat, right? Now, God is so good. He tells us that story for a reason. Now, the mom jumps in and she helps to facilitate this deception, right? And Jacob puts on what? <laughs> now, if you came to me, now, there was, a re there was a reason. Isaac, what was wrong with Isaac? Huh? He was partially blind. He wasn't completely blind. I'll tell you what he had in a second. How's that? He had cataracts. That's exactly what he had. He had cataracts. And cataracts comes as a direct result of inflammation from eating meat. See, I'm telling you, it's right in the Bible staring at us and we don't even see it. Now, if I put some animal's hide hair on me and came to you and I want to impersonate my brother who might have some hairy arms and you touch me and I can't really see you but I'm going to check to see if it's you by touching oh very hairy oh it must be Esau do you think I can get that over on you no. so the first problem don't miss it the first problem is that he had cataracts because of his diet the second problem he had was he was unable to discern that which was right there staring at him. That's what that whole story is about. Genesis is replete with this stuff and into Exodus. But Isaac could not discern that that was not his other son and then it led to a whole line of stuff. <sighs> Jacob, supplanter. Da, 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 da. So much more can be said about that, but I'll stop right there. My dear friends, going back to 
Numbers chapter 11. God says here, I'm taking you out of Egypt, and I'm going to give you a different diet. What did he give them? He gave them manna. Did they like it? They didn't like it. They said, no, we, we loathe this stuff. We want to go back. I'm telling you, when you're in, when you're in bondage to these things, they, would even go, they were willing to go back. God forbid the day he took us out of Egypt. We should have just stayed there. You, get, you catch that? Tie us up, put us in bondage, make us work all day, but make sure we can get a nice filet mignon. Make sure that we can get a piece of chicken, some steak, something with some leeks and garlic. Mm. To shorten their lives. That's what, that's what we're told. Right there in Genesis chapter 9, it was, their life was required. That's what the Bible says. It was required of them, but it's spelled out even more so in the spirit of prophecy. It says in Council on Diet and Foods that God gave them flesh foods to eat to shorten their lives. There was a real big problem, apparently, with 900-year-old sinners. You can learn a lot of sin over a few centuries. And then when they actually gave, when he gave them meat to eat, it reduced their life down from 900 and some down to 175. Just like that. And now we're just down to three score and ten. Okay, so God gave them manna to eat. They didn't like it. They wanted to go back to the flesh pots. And God said, okay. They're crying. They're weeping at their tents. A million people weeping and crying, Vicky, in their tents over meat. Don't miss it. They're weeping and crying because they want meat. And Moses and God got into an argument. And God said, go take your people. And he's Moses said, they're not my people, they're your people. And God says, they are your people. And he said, no, they're your people. They went back and forth. And finally, finally, God said, I'll tell you what, Moses, go tell them to come, and I'm going to tell them what they're going to do. He says, I will give you quail to eat. So much so that it's coming out your nose. Now, this is my question for you, because it's a righteousness by faith question, and it will cement and make clear what God was trying to teach them. My question to you is, what was God's objective? Where was he taking them? Where did he want to take them? Where did he want to take those people who had just been freed from Egypt? Where? And we call that the, where is he wanting to take you? And 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that the things that happened to Israel were for what? For us to learn from, right? We are now repeating, don't miss it, we are repeating Israel's history, step by step, every step of the way. Everything that they did, we're doing. Everything. In fact, I can read you a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. She said, many times we look at what took place with Moses and the children of Israel, and we judge them that they could be so, they could be so ungrateful. And she says these next words, we are worse. So don't ever criticize them again in Sabbath school. I know we like to do it. So God wanted to take them into the promised land. He wants to take us into the promised land. That's what he wants to do. So in taking them into the promised land, he gave them a different diet. What did he do for us? Did he change our diet? 1863, God gave us a different diet. 1863. This church started in 1863. In the exact same year, he gave us a different diet. They were eating pork back then. Joseph Bates even argued with Ellen White at first about talking about eating pork. And she says, no, God says, don't touch it. It's unclean. And then they all said, oh, wow, it is in the Bible. So God gave us a a different diet. He wants to take us into the promised land. He wants to take them into the promised land. And they rejected the manna. Do we reject the health message? Do we reject the health message? Somebody told me I did it at my own church back in Maryland. Um, I brought, it was, July was the health emphasis month, and like here, I, I brought in a speaker, and I spoke myself, and there are certain people who, who walked out, they said, we will not stay and listen to a health message. Oh, it's bad. They said, we, I'll be back after the month of July. 
It's really bad. We're repeating Israel's history. We're repeating it. So, but here's what I want you to understand. Very clearly, go study it for yourself. In, in Numbers chapter 14, it all comes to a head because God sends out two spies, right? I'm sorry, how many spies? Twelve from all the tribes. They go out, they, they search out the land and say, oh, it's a goodly land. We can take it. We are well able to take it. A good report came from Joshua and Caleb. Good report. The other ten said, no, we're like grasshoppers. These people are huge. They're giants. We can't do it. But God had already promised them, listen, don't miss it. God had already promised them, the Lord thy God shall fight for you, and you shall not have to fight in this battle. Was he lying to them? How did righteousness by faith manifest itself for them? And they didn't battle. What did they do once they got to Jericho? They marched. Did they throw one blow? Did they shoot one arrow? Did they throw a spear? Maybe a slingshot. Not once. All they did was march around a city. How many times? Seven times. Seven times. And then what happened to those walls? They came tumbling down. We, we sing that song. And God was showing, if I'm with you, do what I tell you to do. It will be my power, and my power is so great, I can have walls come tumbling down in San Diego. And you'll have nothing to do with the physics of why it happened. But they rejected the message of righteousness by faith. That's what would have happened or could have happened for them, but it didn't happen. So God gave them a meal for them to accept righteousness by faith. You didn't hear what I just said. God changed their diet, cleaned up their diet so they could accept righteousness by faith. The problem was they didn't believe. Because when you believe, that counts to you for righteousness. Do you believe today? Not rhetorical. Let me ask it again. Do you believe today? Do you believe that God is the source of all righteousness? Do you believe that God has imputed and imparted it to you? Do you believe that as weak as you are, as broken as you may be, God is going to do something special that you could never do in your own strength or according to your own understanding or your own anything, that God will do it for you? Do you believe that once you do it, that you will give God all the glory and all the praise and that the people who witness it, they will say, it could not have been them who did it. They have a God. Do you believe today that Jesus is coming soon and that the right arm of the gospel is the right arm of the gospel is the health message and it is righteousness by faith and it's going to bring the scene of misery to an end. Do you believe that today? Amen. When you say amen, you're saying, I believe. May God bless you as you are infused with the righteousness of Christ and his life may it live, be lived out perfectly in you every single day. And you will know it. You will know it when those thoughts in your head go away. Are you listening to me? And I'm not just talking about the thoughts about other people, but also the thoughts about you. I think they call it stinking thinking. I can't do it. It's too hard. It's too much. We don't have enough people. Church isn't ready. Church is asleep. We can't do anything. All that. Holy Spirit is there. And when Christ is in you, by faith, because Jesus would never say it. Jesus would say, give me 12 people and I'll turn this whole world upside down. I'll do the whole thing. Amen? 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 And amen. Let's stand for prayer. If you want to ask, have a few questions, that's fine. Or you can... Just be dismissed. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father. Wow.
I'm humbled, Lord, by such a message. It's humbling because, Lord, I know that it's your message, and I even think, who am I to give it? But it was important to you that it be given. And Lord, as I mentioned during the 11 o'clock hour, you're not only speaking, but you are also listening. And I pray, Lord, that in the innermost thoughts of those who have heard, those both here in the sanctuary and those who may be tracking this via live stream, I pray, Lord, that the inner thoughts that you are hearing in their hearts is not no, no way, but yea and amen. Then, Lord, I pray that you would come and consume them, come and fill them, come and do for them that which is not in their power to do for themselves. And may it be in such an organized and orderly fashion. If it is chat, let it be so. If it's something else, Lord, you said, we aren't to be jealous of anything that is working for you and not against you. So whatever it is, Lord, I pray that people would find their path. Time is wrapping up and you're soon to come, but the crisis is coming before it. And I pray, Lord, that we would all be wise virgins with oil in our lamps, ready to go out to meet you when the bridegroom comes. So, Father, thank you so much for being with us and answering our prayer. Bless this church, bless this community of believers, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you. Oh, yes. <laughs>